Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. It's Jessica Ward King, the Stigma Crusher here. Welcome to this channel. If you like to hear content about mental health from somebody who has lived experience of mental illness, I struggle with bipolar disorder, as well as a PhD in experimental psychology. So I try to bring both of these perspectives to my videos. So today I wanted to talk about a question I get asked a lot. Why do we use the same medications to treat, for example, depression and anxiety? So if you go to the doctor with symptoms of major depressive disorder, like you're feeling sad all the time, things that you used to enjoy you don't enjoy anymore, you're tired, or uh, you're sleeping too much or not sleeping enough, you're eating too much or not eating enough, you're having trouble thinking, making decisions, those kinds of things, you are likely to get put on what we colloquially call an antidepressant. So something like fluoxetine or Prozac. If you go to the doctor with symptoms of anxiety, so let's say generalized anxiety disorder, where you're worrying all the time about things, you can't stop worrying, uh, you are having trouble sleeping, you are, or sleeping too much, you are um, finding it difficult to concentrate, you are likely to also be put on what we colloquially call an antidepressant, like Prozac, fluoxetine. And people say to me like, oh, but I'm not depressed, I have anxiety. Why am I being put on an antidepressant? The answer is not a simple one. Um, so to start with, there are what we call anxiolytics or anti-anxiety medications. These include the for benzodiazepines, so things like Valium, um, that can really help to dull anxiety like in the moment, but are for one thing, they're, they're, they can be very addictive for some people, um, but for another thing, they're not particularly effective in actually solving the anxiety long term. So they, they can help reduce anxiety in the moment. So for example, I remember when um, we had to take my son to the dentist to get fillings and he's deathly afraid of needles. And the doctor said, well, why don't you try giving him some Valium essentially um, to reduce that anxiety when he has to get the needles so he'll be more calm and relaxed for that moment. But it's not going to like stop the, the fear of needles. It's not going to stop the anxiety that he feels on a daily basis. So those anxiolytics have their place, but their place is not in long term use. They are very highly addictive for a lot of people. And they also tend to lose their effectiveness as time goes on. So you start on, let's say, one milligram, and that will work for maybe a week or two. And then after that, you need two milligrams in order to get the same effect. One milligram just doesn't cut it anymore. So for those reasons, our anxiolytics are not very effective in long term treating anxiety. So why do you take an antidepressant to treat anxiety? One of the reasons is that we only call them antidepressants because that was like the first thing we noticed that they did. So it's not like the drug itself is like, look at me, I am an antidepressant. The drug itself is like, look at me, I do these certain things in the body and in the brain. And if they happen to treat depression, then you may call them an antidepressant, but that's not the only thing that they do. Antidepressants also happen to treat anxiety, as I've mentioned. They happen to be really good at long-term reducing the number of chronic headaches, chronic daily headaches, or even chronic migraines that people experience. Some antidepressants are really good at chronic pain, things like fibromyalgia or even chronic fatigue syndrome. So, these, these drugs that we are calling antidepressants, we're only really calling them that because that was the first and most profitable thing that we noticed that they did. And so they're called that because the drug companies decided to market them as that. Okay, so that's the first thing to notice. So it's not like you're being given an antidepressant for anxiety. You're being a given a medication that happens to treat anxiety and also happens to treat a bunch of other stuff, including depression. So that's number one. Number two is that our current, the current state of psychiatric medications is kind of like trying to do brain surgery with a butter knife. So we, we develop these medications and we think that they're having certain effects in the brain. We think this 
because for one thing, they have those effects when we put them onto brain tissue in a Petri dish. So you've heard, I'm sure, that things like SSRIs like Prozac, they increase serotonin in the synaptic cleft. So they decrease the, the amount of serotonin that cells can reuptake. That's why they're called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So the cells can't reabsorb that serotonin, so it just stays there between the cells and keeps stimulating the cells. That's what we think that they do and how we think that they work because that's what they do in a petri dish that's what they seem to be doing in a rat's brain and in a monkey's brain in a human's brain it's a lot harder to tell if that's what they're doing though we have reason reasonable evidence to believe that they are in fact doing that but we don't know if that's what's causing the effects so one of the arguments against that being what caused the effects is that happens almost immediately. Like you take the medication, it gets through the blood brain barrier and it starts to block the reuptake of serotonin. It takes anywhere from two to six weeks for an antidepressant medication to take effect, whether that's for depression or for anxiety. Two to six weeks. So if it's having that biological effect immediately, why is it taking two to six weeks to work? We don't know. Butter knife right? <laughs> um, and so we're not actually 100% sure what it is in that medication or what the effect is that is causing the behavioral and the emotional and the cognitive changes. It could be that there is an effect on genetics here, not the genetics that you inherit. It's not like it's rewriting your genetic code, but it could be in terms of the way these things are, are transcribed and expressed genetically. That could be the difference. That could be why it takes so long. So it might be that we have it completely wrong. What is wrong? We don't have really great evidence that the cause of depression or the cause of anxiety is low serotonin in the synaptic cleft. We just know that the medications that we give that tend to work for those things do make the serotonin be more in that synaptic cleft. So we've kind of like assumed that that's the effect. And so therefore we've assumed that both depression and anxiety have similar conditions in the brain, that there's not enough serotonin. Now I'm talking a lot about serotonin. There are other antidepressant medications that are used for anxiety as well called selective um, norepinephrine in uptake, reuptake inhibitors because norepinephrine is another uh, um, neurotransmitter in the brain. And it, those medications seem to help with some people's depression and some people's anxiety too. So, so maybe it's not serotonin, maybe it's norepinephrine. And then we have other medications that are selective serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and those work for some people. So basically, again, the butter knife analogy. We are going at brain surgery with butter knives sometimes when it comes to psychiatric medications. A lot of the medications were developed because they were developed for something. And then we gave people those medications for something, like one of the famous ones is tuberculosis. We developed a medication for tuberculosis. We gave people with tuberculosis that medication and then noticed that they were a lot happier and went, hmm, maybe this medication is also treating depression and then started doing trials and figured out that yes, indeed it is and then started calling it antidepressants. So that's another of the reasons. A third reason that you might be taking antidepressants for anxiety is that there is a significant amount of overlap between the diagnostic criteria for depression and anxiety. Some of the cardinal symptoms are completely different. So for anxiety, you don't expect for someone to feel sad and depressed all the time. You don't expect for them to have what's called anhedonia or loss of interest in activities that they used to find pleasurable. Those are the kind of the cardinal symptoms of depression that you have to have one of those symptoms in order for it to be called depression. But there are other symptoms like worrying a lot that are chief among both of them, like cognitive symptoms, so not being able to make decisions, not being able to think clearly, that appear in both diagnostic criteria, like insomnia, problems sleeping, that appear in both, fatigue, that appears in both. And so there are some of those symptoms 
that we see appearing in both that these medications might address. And so if you are taking, and, and we know that a lot of people with depression tend to also suffer from anxiety. They do, they, they do clump together. Um, and I have found in the past that has been the case with me. I've had anxiety and depression clumped together. And when you treat one, the other one tends to get treated. And so we find that some people who have that constellation of symptoms of anxiety that also match with that constellation of symptoms in depression tend to get a lot of benefit from antidepressants. So there are three reasons why you might be taking an antidepressant even though you have anxiety. The, the chief among them in my mind is that it's only called an antidepressant because that's how we marketed it. Really, that's not what it is. And I mean, I can, I can further this conversation by saying that like, as a person with bipolar disorder, I take antipsychotic medications. Even though my current symptoms are not psychotic in nature, I, that can happen with both depression and mania in bipolar disorder, but that's not why I'm taking antipsychotic medications. I'm taking them because they seem to work for people with bipolar disorder. They seem to work as mood stabilizers, they seem to work to help the depressive symptoms of, uh, of bipolar disorder, and they seem to work in terms of the manic symptoms to help kind of lower the energy. In terms of like for anxiety, anti people with, with anxiety uh, report that antidepressants tend to like lower the, the volume of their anxiety in their heads. And that lets them help, uh, helps let them do therapy more effectively, for example, because it's really hard to do therapy when like your anxiety is at 110%, you can't do the work, you can't concentrate on anything else. And so having those SSRIs, for example, on board that helps lower the volume of the anxiety to, you know, 50% gives you that space to do the work. And that might also be why they're helping because they're, they're helping enough that then the other therapies that you're doing can work. So it's really a complex issue. But what I would say is if you feel like you're taking the wrong medication, it's probably not the medication's fault and everything to do with the marketing and... Um, there are a lot of reasons why we would use a medication for both. Lots of medications in Western medicine are used for more than one uh, indication. And so, for example, a, a new one for diabetes, Ozempic, um, it was found in, in clinical trials that people on this, this drug lost a lot of weight. Well, now it's the newest diet craze, right? It's the newest weight loss drug. You take Ozempic to lose weight. You're on diabetes you take it to lose weight. So a lot of medications, this happens. We develop it for one thing. We test it. Excuse me. We test it. We find that it has another effect and they're like, Hey, why not? It is big pharma. It is drug companies. And if they see that there is an indication for something, then why not test it? Why not use it? And for the, from the patient's point of view, if there's something that'll help, great. Personally, I don't care what it was developed for. As long as it's going to help me, I'm happy. So try to think of it that way. Um, if you have any questions about this or about any other topics relating to mental health, please do leave them in the comments down below. Remember to hit subscribe if you want to see more content like this, um, as well as more updates. You may have noticed as I've been talking that I'm talking a little faster and a little bit more emotive than usual. Yes, the depression has lifted. I'm now into hypomania. Yay! Uh, so you may get yourself an update next week. So if you are in for that, uh, keep watching. And um, yeah, have a great week, everyone. I will see you in my next one. Take care. Bye. Stigma Crusher.